So howdy, my name is uh, Dr. Rob Parks and I am the deputy director of the observatory here at George Mason. And so we're here, we seem to be constantly updating the format of this, uh, this event series. Right now we are doing a uh, hybrid. So we have obviously new folks in person, which I'm very, very excited about. And then we have a collection of folks that are online. And so the way this is gonna work, hopefully, is uh, we're going to go through the events here in person. And then we're gonna to go to the observatory once we're done with this portion of the event. Uh, those of you online, uh, you're going to stick around if you'd like. And one of our tour guides is going to online give you a closed dome tour of our observatory, kind of let you know what we do here, how things get done, uh, that sort of thing. The rest of you, we're gonna actually meander over to our observatory. And if it's clear, which I don't think it is, um, if it's clear, we're definitely going to open up for you. Uh, if it isn't, then we'll give you an, a closed down tour uh, and just talk about the observatory. And particularly, if it is cl cloudy, when you can come back, because we are now instituting uh, a new sort of thing here where we have public hours uh, mm -hmm. on Thursday, Fridays, and Saturdays, where uh, I can't remember the exact times. Basically, we open up the observatory for an hour. On those days, first come, first serve. If you want to come, right? If not, uh, and then also we have, if that time is inconvenient, we also uh, will continue to be doing private tours for those who request it. So, um, so without further ado, let me give you my screen. <laughs> All right, hopefully you all can see that at home. Uh, again, if you can't hear me, please uh, let me know and I'll try to adjust that. As I said, welcome to George Mason Observatory. We are, this is a talk series that we do, Evening Under the Stars. So, uh, that work? That work? That work? Every time, I just can't check. No. Okay. So, um, yeah, so we are uh, evening under the stars. Like I said, um, we are the telescope. If you are familiar with campus, the telescope is on Research Hall or attached to Research Hall, which is that away. Our nice silver dome. Uh, our telescope is on top of it. Uh, that right there is our control room. That's essentially where we're going to be taking you uh, after uh, the portion here is over. These images that you see along the outside, those are images that have been taken over the years by students here at George Mason. Uh, these are sort of the first generation of images that have been taken. Uh, we have, we are constantly growing an active students uh, organization club and also uh, undergraduate and graduate research. And they're constantly not only uh, doing work with the telescope, but also having fun in creating pretty pictures like this. When I say that this is the first generation, this is what we're still doing now, is or trying to do now, is there is an iconic image of Hubble, which is called the Hubble Deep Field. And not to go too much into it, but essentially the director of the Hubble Telescope said, I need this many hours or this many orbits, and I want to look at absolutely nothing in the sky and see what I can see. And he created one of the most iconic, scientifically important images in science because what he found was just an amazing field of galaxies that no one had ever seen before. So we're kind of trying to do that here in that in a way. Uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to expose our known object for as long as we can, get as much light as we can. For instance, this is the Cocoon Nebula. From my understanding, they collected 17 hours worth of data to, compile, to, to create that image. This is something that is currently ongoing. This is a spiral galaxy whose name uh, escapes me at the moment. Uh, that is, like I said, currently being in progress. But that's the sort of thing that we're trying to, to do uh, here. So you being on the stars of the set is a, is a speaker series plus observatory tour that occurs Thursday evenings from 7 to 9. It is hybrid. You can join us here in person or uh, online. We try to get them every alternating Tuesdays, but um, really it's twice a month at this point. So those, the next one is going to be the 21st of 
uh, this month. The format is a 30 to 45 minute talk, followed by about a 10, 15 minute Q&A, and then we have uh, the telescope tour itself. Uh, so this, the observatory is not a one person operation. As I said, my name is Rob Parks. I'm the deputy director. Dr. Peter Plavchen is our director. And then we have a number of graduate students and tour guides. M is one of our graduate students who's going to be helping us out. And Nasir right there is one of our uh, tour guides who's also going to be helping us out this evening. In addition to that, if, particularly if you're a student of the university, I encourage you to go to the or investigate the Friends of the Observatory. I don't know if this still works, but this is supposedly a QR, a code to get you to the Discord. Uh, Jonathan Saldana is the current president, and he does, oh, does? Oh, sweet. Um, file changes. Uh, Jonathan is, is, um, uh, is doing great work with the club, and he has greatly managed to uh, expand it. We're, they are currently meeting in once, once a month, uh, just for a meeting, and then they get the run of the telescope every other Tuesday. So Photon, the Friends of the Observatory, is going to have a photo night where next Tuesday they get to have the telescope for about three hours and under supervision, they get to pretty much do anything with it they want. Um, and then, well, they are also learning about us photography, as I said, and they're going to be taking trips to other observatories uh, along the Eastern Seaboard, like Green Bank and West Virginia, which is a radio place. If you're interested in what we do here at the observatory, uh, just in a more casual sort of sense, I, I encourage you to subscribe to our newsletter, The Moon, where we feature stories about our students, what our research is doing, and just top, uh, basically topical, you know, what's happening in the sky, that sort of thing. If you are, uh, if you like what you see and you would like to help us in grow our department, because one of the things that I personally am trying to do here is I am uh, taking the reins of our public outreach, and I'm trying to bring our astronomy not just here to the campus, but also to uh, schools around the uh, schools around Fairfax, elementary schools, high schools, that sort of thing. We have telescopes and an inflatable planetarium that we are very much wanting to actually bring to folks um, who would request them. But unfortunately, that does take a little bit of financial support. So if you like what we do and you'd like to support us in some way, please uh, consider becoming a patron of the observatory. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce us to Al Powell. He is a friend of mine from Novak, the Northern Virginia Astronomy Collector. He is a, a club <laughs> collector. A uh, club. He is a meteorite collector. Uh, his collection now is over 400 specimens, as he says. About that. Um, and he is a part time planetarium lecturer at planetariums, or has been a part time planetarium lecturer at planetariums in Connecticut, uh, and has presented the stars tonight at the uh, Einstein Planetarium at the National Air and Space Museum, among many, many other things in his career. So I will give it, I will switch it over to his slides, and he will talk about uh, postcards from space, postcards from the solar system, postcards from the solar system, and then after that, he we will brighten the lights, and you are all free to come up here and uh, explore his collection as well. So without further ado, That's me with my telescope and my game face on. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Professor Parks, for inviting me. And uh, good evening, Patriot Nation. You guys. <laughs> okay. So, what I'd like to do is run through uh, some uh, visuals for a while and talk a bit and uh, get through as much as I can, and then uh, have you spend some quality time with uh, some of these specimens here, uh, which uh, the ones that are out 
Uh, you are free to just touch, pick up. Please be gentle. And uh, you can also take uh, photographs of them or with them as you uh, see fit. So I'll start off. Uh, 10 years ago, next week, as a matter of fact, at about 9.20 in the morning, a very bright light showed up in the sky over the southwestern part of Russia. And people went uh, running to their windows because this thing for a brief period of time outshone the sun. So unfortunately, about a minute or two later, the sonic boom hit and the concussive shock shattered windows of about 7,200 buildings in the area. And about 1,500 people were injured from things like flying glass. So a little bit later on, they found a, uh, many rocks, including this large one, which punched a hole in a, uh, a pond out there. And so it could only leave us with one conclusion. Chicken Little was right. <laughs> but anyway, I do have a specimen of uh, Chelyabinsk, which is what the meteorite is called uh, here on the table. So it, my journey started with a GIF, and that's also here on the table, by the way, uh, of a meteorite. And then uh, didn't think you know, more than a normal appreciation for a gift. But uh, a few years later, it hit me. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this would be good for cloudy day astronomy outreach. And so that's when I started really seriously considering collecting. I'd like to talk about a few basics in terms of Meteorites. There's a thing called a meteoroid, which is a small solid solar system body just hanging out in space. A meteor is a meteoroid that enters Earth's atmosphere and will glow due to frictional heating. Your proverbial uh, shooting stars or falling stars. Those usually aren't much bigger than the eraser on a pencil. And a meteorite is a meteoroid or a piece of a meteoroid that survives its trip through the atmosphere and can be found somewhere here on Earth. And so I've got a nice little animated GIF file that shows the difference between those three concepts. So if you see something fall and uh, pieces are recovered is called a fall. Uh, that's a uh, very technical term. As opposed to a fine, which is a meteorite that has not been uh, witnessed or documented uh, falling through the atmosphere. So uh, again, up top here, we have uh, Chelyabinsk. And uh, here we have the world's largest meteorite, which is still mostly buried, called Hoba, which is out in Namibia. And as you can see from uh, these lovely pie charts that uh, uh, it is actually pretty rare to actually see a fall uh, or to recover a fallen meteorite. Most of them are finds well after the fact that they fell. So most meteorites are named for the geographical entity where they are found, uh, such as Chelyabinsk over here. And uh, then they have uh, special rules of multiple meteorites that are unrelated are found in the same location here. And sometimes, uh, for uh, Antarctic or uh, some Sahara meteorites, 
the number after the location contains the year of discovery. A little bit of history. Meteorite, meteoritic iron beams found in Egypt have been dated to about 3300 BC. And uh, from uh, the tomb of King Tut, uh, they've recovered a dagger, which is made out of meteoritic iron. It's thought to have been a gift to, I think, to Tutankhamun's father from uh, present-day Turkey. And the Inuit have used hammered pieces of the Cape York meteorite for lance heads uh, from as much as almost a thousand years ago. And so I do have a piece of uh, Cape York here on the table as well. The earliest witness fall in the Western world with preserved pieces was on November 7, 1492, near a town called Ensisheim in Alsace, that's uh, uh, in France. I uh, got a small piece of that as well. And in 1794, Ernst Schladny published a scientific treatise proposing an extraterrestrial origin for meteorites. Before that time, people thought they must have come somewhere from the Earth. In 1802, though, chemist Edward Howard discovered that iron meteorites contained alloys that aren't found in Earth deposits, and that stony meteorites contain the metal nickel, which is very rare for Earth rocks. Hmm. Now, in 1803, the question was finally settled when Jean-Baptiste Biot was sent to analyze a recent meteorite fall in uh, Lego France, and he uh, wrote up a report that convinced the scientific community that meteorites were indeed extraterrestrial. So one of the things that uh, I'd like to uh, specify or stress for you young scientists is that it is not only important to do great science, but it is also very important to communicate well about it. Well, the first recorded fall in the U.S. occurred in Weston, Connecticut on December 14, 1807. And so I've got a piece of that here too. <laughs> now, where do meteorites come from? Well, most of them are pieces of asteroids, and they're older than any Earth rock. And so, uh, in some cases, there are asteroids that are uh, sort of made of the primordial materials of the solar system. Things that weren't quite big enough to form planets in the asteroid belt. And so, uh, they have, uh, some of them are big enough to undergo internal heating. When that happens, things start to melt. And when that happens, the real heavy stuff, like the metals go to the core and the lighter rocky material, your olivines and peroxines and all those uh, good um, minerals that you're aware of go to outside that. Uh, and then depending on uh, the, the size of it, well, different pieces break up and uh, the pieces may end up here on Earth. However, not all meteorites come from asteroids. A few come from the Moon and Mars. Something hits those bodies, blasts material off the surface greater than their escape velocity. And again, after uh, thousands or perhaps millions or so of years, uh, pieces might find their way here to Earth. So, meteorites, how are they classified? Well, there are multiple classification systems. There, you can classify them by their structural uh, structure and physical appearance. And this is sort of the uh, earlier, simpler classification. 
So it's an older system, easier to apply. And uh, so you see uh, a lot of meteorites referred to by that. However, the newer system tries to go and studies the chemical properties of these guys. And so as a result, uh, it's more complicated, but it aids in grouping them by perhaps uh, the body that they might have come from or the type of body. And just to make things even more confusing, hybrid classification schemes are common as well. So the simple classification is stony, iron, and stony iron. <laughs> okay. So it's not too hard to remember. To talk about the stony ones that were the uh, I guess the prevalence of each type, you can see that stony meteorites are by far the majority of meteorites that have been recovered. And that number today is a little almost 71,000. And so almost 98% are stony. Uh, about 2% are iron, and uh, let's say half a percent or so are stony irons. The stony ones have these things in them called chondrules. And they're these little spherical inclusions, little round grains of stuff that are some of the very first things that solidified in the solar system. So what I like to say is that these things were solid when the Earth itself was liquid. And their composition is mostly olivine and peroxine, which are a mixture of iron and magnesium and silicates. And they're usually encased in some sort of what you call feldspathic material, which are silicates mixed with sodium, uh, potassium, or calcium aluminum. So the stony meteorites that contain these chondrules are called chondrites. And other meteorites are called achondrites, <laughs> which is a way of saying not chondrite. And you can see how they're kind of broken up into various types. And another technical term, the most common type is called ordinary. Figure. Uh, then there are carbonaceous chondrites, and some of them do contain carbonates, but most show signs that uh, well, as they were forming, they were forming in the presence of liquid water. Hmm. And then there are some others, enstatites, rumorudiites, and the very rare katangariites. And uh, I think there are only maybe two or three of these types that are in and I wish I had one. <laughs> so these things that the uh, chondrites can contain are calcium aluminum in rich inclusions, and uh, they have been dated to be more than four and a half billion years old. So those are believed to be the very, very first solids that formed in the protoplanetary disk around the sun. So they form before the Earth. They're usually light colored and irregular in shape. And some chondrites uh, do contain these. And you can see uh, this one has been split in half to show uh, not only the chondrules, you can see around who that's here, but the uh, CAIs that it contains. And you can see uh, perhaps a, a CAI or two in the sample of Allende which is the carbonaceous chondrite that I've brought uh, today. And just to show where they, we think they are formed in the solar system. So here is a schematic of the solar system out to the planet Mars. And so uh, the enstatite chondrites uh, are the ones that seem to have formed uh, around the orbits of Venus and Earth. Other types form further out. And so you can see now here is Mars and here's Jupiter. 
and your asteroid belt is sort of in between there. The ordinary chondrites, which are the most prevalent, uh, formed uh, you know further than Mars and sort of in the uh, inner fringes of the asteroid belt. The Rumeruti chondrites formed a little bit further out from those, and the furthest out are the carbonaceous chondrites, which formed uh, in the outer part of the asteroid belt. And some recent uh, studies indicate that some of them may even have formed further out, even past the orbit of Jupiter to where present day Saturn might be. It's about twice as far as Jupiter from the sun. Yeah, many meteorites, including the stony ones, do contain metal, and most of the metal is a mixture of iron and nickel. You know, kids even know what an iron is these days? <laughs> so iron and nickel are the most common magnetic elements. And as we mentioned before, asteroid differentiation, the <laughs> melting, of uh, the core of an asteroid or the innards of an asteroid results in most metals accumulating in the core. And uh, metal meteorites uh, was one of the early clues that the Earth itself has a metal core. Now, iron meteorites under very slow cooling conditions, like a few degrees every million years, can form these fancy uh, patterns these crystal patterns that are known as Binnenstetten patterns, easy for me to say, or Thompson structure. And so they're like snowflakes in a way because there are no two that are alike. The stony iron meteorites come in two flavors, basic. One is called a palisite, and those are iron meteorites with embedded olivine crystals. And it's named after a scientist named Peter Pallas, who was the first to really analyze these things. And they are arguably the most beautiful meteorites. In fact, a lot of them are used for jewelry. The other type are called mesosiderites. Those are about half rock and half uh, metal. So the simple classification again is stony, stony irons and irons, stony uh, chondrites and achondrites, stony iron palisite and metal siderites, and irons, uh, they are characterized by the type of crystal structure they might uh, have, whether it's a hexahedral crystal structure, an octahedral crystal structure, or no crystal structure. Now, the newer classification uh, does take a different additional look at iron meteorites and uses trace uh, elements, gallium, germanium, and iridium, and their proportions to nickel to try and group them together. And uh, they have a whole number of different groups, four groups and seven subgroups, which have uh, been uh, sort of partitioned out, and then sometimes they're merged together merged together again uh, due to more recent studies. So, and even with all that, there's still about 15% of iron meteorites that are still ungrouped. So they're like none of the above. <laughs> so the newer one uh, is by the type of uh, sort of asteroid they came from, whether it was undifferentiated, weren't big enough to melt out. And so that's where your chondrites come from. You're differentiated, which melted up. So you have your achondrites, which includes uh, most of your irons and uh, some other uh, stony meteorites that come from uh, asteroids that differentiated. And then there's some that are in between, which are called primitive achondrites. So uh, asteroids that didn't fully uh, melt up. And so they have their own uh, relatively rare uh, types of meteorites that we've noticed. How does a, uh, a guy who's more of a gatherer than a hunter like me get them? 
Well, nomadic peoples look for anomalous stones in the desert, because that's where most meteorites that come to the market are from places where meteorites are uh, show up pre pretty well. So again, uh, these uh, people then sell these uh, meteorites to middlemen in a marketplace, and there might be more than one level of middlemen. And eventually they get sold to dealer collectors. Now, if they're thought to be a new or uncommon specimen, the owner will send a sample to a lab for analysis and classification. The resulting information will then be submitted to a special committee in the Meteoritical Society for official naming and certification. And then, depending on how much they think it's going to be worth, the owner may slice and dice the specimen to sale. Now, there are some things that are associates of meteorites. That's what I call them, anyway. Things that are related to meteorites. For example, there are these things called tectites. And sort of that's like melted dirt. So it's the glassy terrestrial debris from meteorite impact. They kind of similarly look uh, like uh, uh, obsidian type things or like lava that you might see. And so I've got uh, several of those up here. There are these things called impactites, and that's earth rock that's either created or modified by meteoritic impact. And so uh, uh, this is one from Germany where the the pounding that the earth took from the meteorites sort of crunched up the rock in sort of like a natural concrete. And that just actually, uh, they quarried that stuff and used it to build their cathedral there without even knowing that they were in a uh, very large uh, crater. There is natural glass, which is the melt product resulting from an atmospheric meteorite explosion. And so again, uh, that's like fried dirt or sand, as the case may be, where something's exploded in the air and the heat melted the ground. And so this is a sample of pica glass, which is from the Atacama Desert in northern Chile. And I have a sample of that here as well. Then there's impact sediment, which is earth sedimentary rock that contains evidence of a meteoritic impact, like the one that kind of uh, did in the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. And so I have a sample of that here as well. And just to show a, a little diagram of tectites, uh, what happens is that they can have all sorts of different shapes depending on how big the melted piece that uh, came uh, blasted off the earth was, how far off it went into the atmosphere, and whether it was uh, uh, rotating or not. And so again, you'll be able to see a, a sort of a blobby type as well as one that is shaped sort of like a dumbbell or a dog ball. So some frequently asked questions. How would someone know that a rock on the ground is a meteorite? Well, it would be very helpful if you knew what the common rocks in your area were. And so, so you'd have to know what the common stuff is to know what is unusual. Having said that, if it's unusual and it is heavier than you would expect a rock of its size to be, uh, that would be a good sign. Uh, if it contains the element nickel in it, that would be a good sign. But to really get a final answer, you'd have to send it to a lab. And there are labs that you can uh, send 
uh, meteorite samples to uh, that will uh, for a feed test and tell you most often that it's not a meteorite, but it might be. How do we know that a meteorite is from the moon or from Mars? And uh, the moon, a little bit more straightforward in that we have brought back samples of the moon from the Apollo missions back in the late 60s and 70s. And so they actually have uh, uh, samples to compare these meteorites to. Mars is a little bit different. So the Martian meteorites uh, contain uh, small inclusions of glass, uh, you know, rock that melted upon the impact from Mars. And those can encapsulate small bits of the Martian atmosphere at the time. And so those gases entrapped in the meteorites can actually be actually be uh, tested and they match up pretty well with our measurements of the Martian atmosphere on the rovers that we have on the planet Mars. The meteorites contain any elements not found on Earth? And the short answer is no, because meteorites being asteroids uh, or parts of asteroids, and just like we were all formed from the same primordial stuff uh, that was left over from the formation of the sun in the solar system. So there's no elements that are new. All the elements that we know about are the only ones that we see not only in our solar system, but everywhere in the universe. Look, however, meteorites do contain minerals, some combinations of elements that are either rare or not found here on Earth. So uh, what happens here on Earth is that we have this thing in our atmosphere called oxygen. And oxygen tends to combine with lots of stuff. So many of the uh, uh, minerals that we have here on Earth contain oxygen in one form or another. However, there are uh, meteorites that contain minerals that have no oxygen in them at all, like trollite, which is a iron sulfide. And it has a simple formula, FES. So, got some recommended reading. We'll be given a quiz after this, okay? Uh, so, uh, meteorite, how stones from outer space made our world, is a good general uh, audience introduction to meteorites. Uh, if you really want to dig deep into them, the field guide to meteors and meteorites, even though it's a little bit dated, is still the best overall book. Learn all the details about meteorites. There is a uh, sort of a something in between those two for younger readers called What's So Mysterious About Meteorites. And so I have uh, uh, these two books on the table here as well, as well as the uh, younger reader one. There's an e-magazine, or e I guess I should say, called Meteorite Times. And so it is put out uh, every other month, every odd numbered month. And so it's a good way to uh, sort of learn what's going on in the meteorite world. Uh, from a uh, more from a collector's standpoint than from a pure science standpoint. And finally, on uh, my very rudimentary site, I do have a, a meteorite page that uh, may have some links that may be of interest to you. So what's so special about them? Well, they happen to be the building blocks of planets. They tell us the age of the solar system, including the Earth. They can contain bits of other stars. 
uh, Allende and others have uh, have been studied and they contain nano diamonds. And so these are from the cores of stars that exploded long before the solar system was born. Their impacts changed life on Earth. So for those of you in the back, there's a dinosaur on the left is saying, uh-oh. <laughs> they give us information about asteroids like Vesta over here, Mars, and the moon. And you can hold a visitor from outer space in your hand. So that's my talk. And let's take a photo with a meteorite. Thank you very much for your attention. Before we start with, in with the meteorites, if you know, folks have any questions, uh, we can take them now. Actually, I'm going to take the first one. Um, are you planning on ever going to Antarctica? No, I'm not. Again, I'm a gatherer, not a hunter. <laughs> and so, uh, A, let me get to, there's a little bit of a backstory behind the, to the answer. Uh, most of the meteorites that you'll find in the meteorite database, official meteorites, come from Antarctica. And that's because they're easy to see there. And because the ice sheet that covers Antarctica acts like a conveyor belt, moving stuff from the interior of the continent towards the uh, coastline, which is where you have certain mountain ranges. So the ice sheet sort of bumps up against the mountain ranges and then the wind sublimates the ice exposing meteorites. And so every year, Science scientists uh, do go down there on collecting missions every Antarctic summer. It would be tough to do in the Antarctic winter. So, but yeah, so they uh, go on, a, on an annual basis and scoop up a bunch of meteorites, and many of them end up uh, passing through the uh, Natural History Museum, where they do a lot of classification and analysis of these meteorites that are found there. By treaty, after the late 70s, like 79 or 80, uh, individuals are not allowed to go and uh, pick up meteorites from Antarctica. Uh, the meteorites are solely to be used for uh, scientific and educational purposes. And so, I do have in my collection an Antarctic meteorite from before the treaty. <laughs> but because uh, uh, there are a few of those on the marketplace. But uh, I certainly am uh, not likely to go anywhere to uh, hunt meteorites. One of the things about uh, meteorite hunting, first of all, there was a series of uh, on the Discovery Channel. I think a while back called Meteorite Men, where they, these uh, uh, meteorite hunters would talk about their adventures uh, hunting meteorites, mostly in uh, places like Australia or, uh, or uh, the Sahara area. The uh, issue with any of uh, uh, picking up meteorites anywhere is that uh, the laws vary from country to country as opposed to who owns them. Uh, and whether or not you can legally uh, take them out of the country. So uh, there's a whole, uh, uh, you know, sort of web of various rules uh, uh, regarding that sort of stuff. So people do it, but uh, you have to know uh, what you're doing before going, going into that. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. We, we admit we're here because of the green comet. Uh, so a, a very basic thing is what's different between a comet and was ice and where, where that comes from compared with a meteoroid uh, space. Well, very good question. 
Yeah, so comets are were characterized as sort of dirty uh, snowballs, if you will. So you take you take a really dirty slush ball and, and pack it with some dry ice and then freeze it some more or whatever. And you have the basic building blocks of a comet. And uh, the presence of ices in those things mean that they form pretty far out in our solar system. There are a lot of them, uh, especially uh, those that are very long period comets like the uh, C2022 E3 ZTF, the green comet, uh, have uh, uh, originated probably from the Oort cloud, which is something that has never been seen, but it is, uh, is thought to be out there. Uh, a whole bunch of uh, dirty snowballs out there in the far reaches of the solar system. Uh, again, uh, the asteroidal things uh, are, are planetesimals that never really got together to form a planet, normally because, uh, usually because Jupiter, the big bully that he is, uh, decided that uh, he didn't want any planets that are uh, too close to Jupiter because the gravitational pull of Jupiter would break uh, these guys up before they uh, form fully. So uh, asteroids are more rocky things, although they do have evidence that you know ice was around some of them, but they're not mostly ice. Now, uh, having said that, there are uh, a couple of we don't know of any comets that have exploded over the Earth recently. The possibility is the one that exploded over Tunguska, which was in Siberia in 1908, uh, may have been a comet. It might not have been. It's just because pieces were never found of it. Up here at the table, I actually have a piece of bark from a tree that was felled by that Tunguska blast back in 1908. Um, the Pika glass, though, has been studied, and they think that uh, however many uh, tens of thousands of years ago, uh, a comet might have exploded over what is now the uh, Atacama Desert to create the Pika glass. Because again, it was an air burst, it generated a lot of heat, but not much in the way of traceable uh, solid pieces to be recovered. Yes. Um, so when it comes to um, meteorites, would it be like if, if there was, if there did happen to be a fall of like a, a, of a pretty large one, like at, at some point recently, like how dangerous would it be to approach it like after, or like how long would you wait? Because I know like it's going to be most likely very, very hot because it comes into the atmosphere and then also ah. like, things like this. And then also like since it was from space, it might have like additional like radiation and stuff like that. So. Well, uh, I wouldn't worry about the radiation and I wouldn't worry about the heat um, because uh, radiation would probably have long ago, uh, as old as these things are, uh, the radiation would be uh, minimal at best. You'd probably get more radiation from a banana you'd buy in the store than you get from the meteorite. Now, also consider that these things have come from the cold of deep space. So they are frozen on the inside. And at best, they, as they don't spend a lot of time in our atmosphere to get heated up. And so when they do, uh, that just gives them a sort of toasting. We call that a fusion crust. So that the crust would, the crust would be melted, but it's very thin. So uh, the people who have recovered things that have relatively recently fallen have said that at most, they are maybe a little bit warm to the touch. Yes. Do you have a personal favorite in your college? I'll answer that the way uh, a buddy of mine, who probably was the person behind getting me started in it, my favorite one is the next one. <laughs> I, it's something I don't already have, you know. I, I'm smiling because though when Cal showed me his uh, collection the first time last, uh, <laughs> I got the same way. <laughs> In the back there, young scientist, Buffalo Bills. 
Ben. Thanks for the question. Um, um, so, um, like the, um, the, um, the rarest kind of meteorite, where does that form? Like what part of the solar system? Like it begins with a K, rare kind of meteorite. Oh yeah, those, uh, I think they're, they're also from the asteroid belt. So the Kakangariites, yeah, I don't, I don't know a whole lot about them because I don't have any. Uh, uh, but uh, um, they're they're very they're very rare. Um, but there are other ones that are rare for you know uh, rarity comes about for different reasons. So some are rare because of the uh, circumstances. You know, for example, there are some that when they fall, they hit something on the earth. I mean, not the ground per se, something man made. And so those are called hammers. And so in 1991 or 92, one went through the trunk of a, a car parked in a driveway in Peekskill, New York. And so those are called hammers. And I have a little piece of that one here, as a matter of fact. And I've got a book that shows a photograph of the car. So, uh, um, so anyway, things can be rare for that reason. Uh, they can be rare, really rare is a, a piece of the one that hit a person, for example, uh, that's rare. And they're just uh, some other uh, rare types that, uh, you know, because they're desirable, they are either not uh, too widely available, and if they are, they're very expensive. Young scientists back there. Yeah. What's the rarest? Asteroid. Where's asteroid? Well, asteroids are pretty common. There are actually millions of them out there. So the asteroids themselves aren't rare, uh, but it is rare to have a fresh piece of an asteroid. And there are some space missions that have brought back pieces of asteroids and uh, one that we are hoping will bring back a good bunch of asteroidal pieces. So, the rarest, uh, meteorite. rarest meteorite. There are some one offs, and so uh, uh, they are um, trying to think. Yeah, I would say any of these uh, Kakangariites are, are rare. Um, there are, if they discover one, let's say that comes from the planet Venus or Mercury, which is unlikely, Venus especially because of its atmosphere, uh, possibility for Mercury, uh, those might be considered rare. So and there's just some studies that there are a certain type of meteorite called an albright that uh, has some affinities with some of the rocks on Mercury. So they're not sure if that might uh, indicate an origin. So now, also, but there are a lot of a lot of uh, mysterious things about meteorites, and certainly there is a lot to study there as well, and a lot to figure out as to where they come from and what they mean. And uh, one thing that does happen is that the classifications can change over time. That uh, further studies are done. And somebody said, no, it's not this type, it's this other type. And so then uh, some of us have to sort of swear under our breath and go changing our database and, that's, and changing our labels and all that sort of stuff. But it happens from time to time. Yes. So I was interested because you, you said that most meteorites, like 99%, are these uh, the stony type. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, or but, yeah something uh, goodly enough. Right, right. Um, but you said of the ones that uh, that that are found in the United States, only eighty percent. You said twenty percent were iron or or something like right. that. Right, and that's because the iron ones are easy, more easily recognized. Uh, but remember, now most of them are found in Antarctica, where they're all of them are easily recognized, including the small stony one. You know, they're sitting on top of the ice. Where's it going to come from? Whereas uh, if they fall, if a, a small stone falls on uh, in somebody's uh, front yard or the, in the forest or whatever, uh, it's unlikely that it'd be recognized as a meteorite. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So the iron ones are particularly recognizable. And so that's why you'd find a discrepancy of that nature. Uh, in a way, the finds in Antarctica sort of, you know, out of this nearly 71,000 meteorites, about 45,000 come from Antarctica. <laughs> so it's not about what, what happens to hit sort of what angle of the earth. No, it's, it's, about, it's about recognition yeah. after the fact. All right. Well, yeah, I think we're. Oh, have you been contacted with viewers and television meteorites? Okay, uh, some of them have. Well, first of all, uh, if you go to say Meteorite Times magazine, uh, they have uh, their last page has some of their sponsors there. But what you can do is, uh, some of them have their own um, websites, and I uh, also there's some that are on. Uh, on eBay. Now, having said that, there is a organization called the International Meteorite Collectors Association, IMCA. And so it IMCA membership sort of functions the way the good housekeeping seal does, so that you have some recourse should somebody sell you who is a member of that, somebody sell you something that's not legit. So if you're going to buy off of, uh, you know, eBay or uh, some or you know Etsy or someplace like that, I would look for someone who is an IMCA member because they will uh, say that they are a member and give their membership number there as well. Okay, so I think at this point we'll open up the basically the table for you to come up and, and look. But before you uh, uh, do that, I just want to say that. Um, so once you've looked at the, the meteorites, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take then walk you over to the observatory. Fortunately, I just checked in with uh, my, my people there and it is cloudy. So what we're gonna do is if you'd like, we can take you over to the observatory and give you a closed dome tour where we talk about the, the observatory itself, what do we do, that sort of thing. Um, and, but if you're interested in coming back, again, I recommend when it is clear, uh, as I said at the very beginning, we have these new public hours now where, uh, and you can check out our website in order to find them. On Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, we have the, the observatory open to the public, whoever wants to show up. If those hours don't work for you, uh, please get in contact with us and we can schedule a private tour. Uh, so, yeah. And for those of you on uh, online, uh, Ian should be taking over soon. For now. All righty. Uh, do you want me to go ahead and start sharing? Yes. No, nuts. Okay. Uh, let's let's proceed to have a reasonable amount of nuts. So, uh, yeah, please, please feel, feel, free to, uh, me feel free to come up here. At any uh, time, and then ask questions. Ready to come over and see her, uh, who's in back. She will help me escort you over. This is all of us at the observatory. Yeah. Can everybody online hear me all right? Fine. I'm going to get a thumbs up in the chat. Uh, do I... Here we go. Going to get a thumbs up in the chat if everybody can hear me all right. Got the audio going. All right. Uh, well, not, my name is Ian. Uh, I'm here in the gamer chair of the GMU Observatory, and behind me are uh, Emmy and uh, Aiden, uh, we are all undergraduate students here at George Mason University. Uh, right now, we are logged in to the uh, mainframe of the GMU Observatory computer, and I have the security cameras uh, pulled up so you can not only see me, but uh, the surrounding area as well. Uh, for, uh, for two, uh, we're inside the control room. Uh, one and four are inside the dome. And number three here is of the roof itself. So if I go ahead and pull this up, uh, this is on the roof of Research Hall. It is the GMU Observatory itself. Uh, over here where the lights are is where we would come up in person. Uh, and then through the door here is how you get access to this telescope. But as you can see, uh, even in the background of the camera itself, it is completely overcast tonight. So if I tried opening up, uh, we would see literally nothing but clouds. 
I love living in the Mid-Atlantic, but at the very least, I can show you how we control the dome with ASCOM dome control. Let's go ahead and spin it around. There we go. It usually takes a few minutes to, to spin. Uh, we can move it left and right, sync it up with the dome, open and close, all that fun stuff. Then on the inside, we have our signature 32 inch Richie Cretion caster grain reflector. Uh, I know I've said a lot of words and most of them probably don't make sense, but all you need to know is that this is a telescope. There are mirrors, uh, there are three of them and they are arranged like so. The first of them is at the bottom, uh, the largest of which uh, is 32 inches across and it is, uh, it, is, it is concave. It is slightly bowl shaped, which redirects light that comes in inwards to focus on it and magnify it inside of the telescope. If I can, uh, I'll get into this uh, pretty soon, but uh, I believe this is how we can show off uh, the, the inside of the telescope through the camera. Just ignore that warning for now. It's been a while since my last virtual tour. Let's see if I, my assumption was correct. That is in fact the opposite direction. Uh, at the very least, go ahead and put it back. So we have to wait for it to stop. Sorry about that. Uh, at the very least, I have this uh, very oversimplified JPEG of how it works. The uh, first mirror here will then move it inwards to the second mirror up top, which is uh, convex, the opposite of concave, which then straightens out the magnified light or even zooms it in a little bit more up to 160 times magnification uh, as even depicted on this image. The secondary mirror uh, can, is mounted on the side and can be moved up and down to focus the telescope towards, I don't like what that noise was, uh, towards uh, <laughs> on a more classical telescope uh, this is where the eyepiece would be, but on ours, we have multiple outputs. Uh, uh, conveniently, uh, the wrong direction was the right direction to show the outputs. Uh, the first of which is the eyepiece right there at an angle. We use a, uh, a third mirror that's flat to adjust uh, our selection of where our output is uh, from the eyepiece to the video camera here to the CCD camera right there, which is actually behind several other devices, that being the AO system in front, adaptive optics that detwinkles uh, starlight in real time with a bunch of wiggly mirrors. And then the filter wheel is that large part, which has seven different outputs, uh, clear, red, green, blue, infrared, ultraviolet, and hydrogen alpha. The last of which is a dark red color, very useful for looking at uh, dark red, or it's a dark red color, very useful for looking at big clouds of hydrogen gas, such as nebulas, like the Orion Nebula. Uh, and then how the camera itself works is that it's a lot like the digital cameras on your phone where it has a bunch of pixels and they individually take in photons, particles of light, and transmit them into electrons, particles of electricity, that can be turned into data signals and read by the computer to make an admittedly crunchy image. But because these pixels don't necessarily care about what sorts of colors, wavelengths of photons it collects, we need to employ the use of our filter wheel in order to detect only certain frequencies of photons, which sounds very tedious because your phone could do it automatically, but here uh, it's it's more precise and sensitive. And so we could have to manually colorize the image by taking up to or at least three different types of images with three different filters uh, to produce a false color image like those uh, seen with Webb or Hubble. You can just use any three of the filters. In fact, most of Hubble's images, including the deep field uh, they were talking about in the main presentation are used with uh, what's next on our shopping list here at the observatory, an 
O alpha filter for oxygen, which is uh, about a light blue color wavelength uh, combined with red and green and blue to highlight regions of oxygen. But to produce a true color image, we only can use red, green, and blue in that order combined with a fancy thing called a dark image, which is literally just taking a picture with the lens cap on, and then a flat image, which is a fancy way of saying taking a picture of the, the wall of the inside of the dome. Uh, and then with these sorts of control images, we can filter out electrical noise from both the the wires uh, collecting all these, uh, collecting all this data, and uh, the cooling fan as well, which is, it's a bit ironic that we need it to make sure the device is running at maximum efficiency, but then the electrical power powering the fan ends up messing with our instruments. Always fun thermodynamics. Uh, but the telescope itself, uh, which I should probably get back to parking, let's do that before I forget, here on the Sky X, uh, which lets us not only see what's up in the sky in real time, but as you've seen twice now, uh, move and control the telescope. Uh, moving the telescope is as simple as pointing and clicking, but if you don't know where something is, you can also type it in the search bar here. It would help if I knew how to spell. Here's Jupiter. Then it appears as this red circle, and we can go ahead and hit find to move the telescope, but I'm not going to do that because it's already moving, and it doesn't like being told to do multiple things at once. Uh, the it shows roughly where the horizon is and directional indicators. The orange line here is a 15 degrees of uh, declination, I believe, uh, uh, vertical above the horizon. We mark that as such because uh, below that distance, we run the risk of scraping the telescope against the floor, which is uh, not good because it was very expensive and we don't like it when things break. I also personally don't like it when the telescope hits me in the back of the head. This has happened exactly three times and I would intend to keep it at a minimum. Uh, more importantly than hitting me in the face, uh, I'm sure you've heard how sunsets work, but below, close to the horizon where there's more air in the way, Images or just light in general gets more and more distorted by the increased angle due to some fun math. And thus, everything right on the horizon appears very wiggly and very red, which, for I mean, just for pictures enough, it would make it not a very good picture. But for our research, it would just make data trash. So we try to keep all observations, especially for uh, fun research stuff within this orange circle here. Uh, you can tell this is this is Polaris. The grid here is equatorial, centered on the equator, and not our local or azimuthal point of view. Uh, and this red area is just a zero degrees longitude. But going back to earlier, I can find my mouse. There we are. The telescope itself has two different motors, one to control the right ascension that we have for the left and right motion this way. We have a special camera on it because it likes to break a lot and we need this one the most because this is the one that keeps up with the rotation of the earth. And then the one here on the side is the declination motor, the one that moves it up and down. But you'll all, you can also tell even from the image itself that the telescope is at an angle. Again, just like the sky axis, it's because it's on an equatorial mount, meaning it's uh, within reference frame of uh, the celestial sphere instead of us. And therefore, it's at a 38 degree angle, roughly the latitude of Fairfax, Virginia, uh, closer to the equator. Uh, the telescope would be a lot further down. Uh, almost vertical, and then at closer to the poles, the telescope would be a lot uh, more vertical up this way, a lot larger angle, uh, because 
everything is circumpolar at the North Pole. Very fun math. Uh, but I know I've, I've been talking a lot about angles. Does anybody have any questions so far? I don't know if there's a chat I can open. Here we can see the in-person crowd arriving on camera three. There they are. Uh, but I overheard in the uh, the main talk, people were interested in the Green Comet. Uh, funny story, uh, this Friday, I ended up taking some images of the Green Comet with the camera. Here's one of them right now. Uh, it is very crusty because I haven't processed it yet because it, it was just this Friday. If I just, uh, the bands here, the bandwidth, uh, we can see it's uh, it's a blob. It's a very photogenic blob, uh, but even then, with some of the best equipment in the world, it's still uh, just a just a green blob. But that that's kind of what comets are. Yes, Taylor, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, what room was everybody meeting in in person? In in explore, do you mean for the? The in-person meeting? Yeah. Uh, exploratory Hall, room 3301. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's it's right by the bus loop, uh, big silver big, big silver building, and it's going to be on the third floor at the end of the hallway. Uh, but this this is a not in fact silver. This is this is green, and we can tell it was green because of the counts here. Pay attention to that maximum number, 7,100. If I go ahead and go back to the folder where all of the common images are. Do, 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 do. I'm going to go ahead and pull up uh, the blue filter. Might take a while to load because these are all 32 megabytes. The processed ones are twice that, 64 megabytes. Here we are at the blue filter image. Next, fiddle around with the bandwidth here. And it's only 2,900 counts, photon counts. And then the red filter. Here we are, here we are again at the crusty blob. Now this one appears to be brighter initially, uh, 9,500. But in my experience, everything here at the observatory appears slightly redder than usual because uh, as it turns out we're in the middle of Fairfax, Virginia, a suburb of Washington DC, which as it turns out is one of the worst light polluted areas in the entire United States of America. Very fun. Give it up for light pollution. Uh, so especially up north where the green comet was, uh, more light is being scattered into the atmosphere from man-made sources or even from the full moon. Uh, and then just like how the Raleigh effect during the day turns the sky, the back, hello, here's, here's the group, here they come. As the Raleigh effect during the daytime turns the sky blue, uh, the same thing happens at night with both the full moon and the uh, man-made light sources turning the background blue and making blue things and green things appear dimmer. Uh, but red is the least affected, uh, partially also why sunsets are red, but also uh, turns into red things being brighter at night, thanks to some fun math. Uh, this is Nasir, he, she's another one of our tour guides and we have a lovely group here with us. Uh, so I pull up another image that I took that I'm very proud of. So being the mouse will let me pick. Sensitivity is a bit whack on these. There we go. Turn down the speed. Four tours. Planets. 
and the great red spot. So this here, uh, this is the planet Jupiter, fifth planet from the sun and largest in the solar system. Even in this unprocessed image that I took in the middle of a tour, just like this one, we can notice uh, the difference between the, uh, the light belts and the, the darker zones caused by the upwelling and descending of dark ammonia, sol and rich compounds within the various storms of the planet. There's also this rounder smudge right here that seems to be a different color than both the belts and the zones, because this is in fact the great red spot of Jupiter, the extremely famous anti-cyclone hurricane, or I guess more accurately, an anti-hurricane that's been spinning around the planet for at least 400 years and has actually been shrinking in size, so it might be numbered in its days, but so far it seems to be holding up well. It's still red, it's still a spot, it's still twice the size of the Earth. Presumably, it keeps maintaining its strength by absorbing the energy of smaller cyclones around it. Uh, the dark red color is thought to be related to the orangish brown of the belts, uh, but presumably the storm is drawing up its signature red color from somewhere deep inside the gas giant. The problem with Jupiter, and applies to Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune as well, is that since they don't have a surface, the only way to actually find out Things about the pro or things about the inside of them is to chuck a probe inside the atmosphere and hope for the best. Uh, usually, after a couple hundred miles of nothing but solid clouds of pressure and heat gets high enough to crush and fry any sort of spacecraft we send inside. So, and the red, the red spot itself, according to math, is probably about a couple thousand miles deep. Uh, so we're, it's going to take a pretty advanced craft to try and see what's going inside in there. Uh, but we don't need some sort of indestructible probe to see something even more exciting in the image. So I mess with bandwidth here to only show the peak. Uh, three bright spots, not this one, this was a star. Three bright spots appear. Uh, does anybody want to take a guess at uh, what these might be? The moons? Yes, these are three of the four Galilean moons named after their discoverer, Galileo Galilei. Uh, the fourth one, I believe that it was Callisto, was behind the planet at the time, leaving uh, Io, Europa, and Ganymede in the picture, but obviously at the, the peak counts because they're obviously a lot smaller than Jupiter and thus reflect a lot less light. Uh, this is this is not with our telescope. This is a collection of various NASA missions. Uh, these four here are Jupiter's biggest moons, uh, the Galilean moons, compared in size to both our moon, the Earth's moon, uh, Saturn's biggest moon, Titan. Thanos does not live here, as well as Neptune's moon, Triton, and the dwarf planet Pluto. Io, the closest of the Galilean moons, this one right here is probably the most volcanic active body in the solar system, having more lava than Earth and Venus and Mars combined because of the intense tidal forces between Jupiter and these three moons right here. Uh, every four orbits Io does, Europa does two, Ganymede does one, Callisto does like two thirds. Because of these whole number ratios, and as well as the fact that uh, Jupiter has more than twice the gravity of Earth. The insides of these moons are being pushed and pulled together very rapidly. Uh, and if, you, if you've ever played with silly putty and like started mashing it together, you'll notice that the putty itself starts to get very, very hot. Now, if, if you multiply this by something larger than the moon, larger than Mercury, and then the second largest thing in the entire solar system, it can start to get really hot in that putty, hot enough, in fact, to melt rock into magma, hence Io being covered in volcanoes uh, and the whole surface being plastered with sulfur and sulfur compounds staying yellow like an old slice of pizza. The eruptions on Io are so violent 
that they've even been captured from crafts like Voyager or New Horizons, material and lava gets shot into orbit around Jupiter, re reaching escape velocity of Io, and then possibly causing all this brown stuff on Europa to accumulate, which, according to our best efforts, is some sort of sulfur compound similar to the ones all over Io. Uh, Europa is this one right here. Uh, despite being where the monoliths in 2001 A Space Odyssey told us not to land, Europa is probably one of the more interesting places in the entire solar system as it's one of the few places where it's highly theorized that there is in fact liquid water. But as we can tell from this image, it can't be on the surface because the surface is covered entirely in ice. Uh, Europa, along with several other places in the solar system, are giant ice balls, just like how the moon, the earth, Mars, Venus, Io are all big rock balls. And these rock balls are filled with molten rock. If it, this is an ice ball, it's filled with molten water, which or molten ice, which is just water, liquid water. Uh, as we know on earth, even at the bottom of the ocean around hydrothermic vents, uh, there can still be life that exists independent of the sun with those like weird tube worms and yeti crabs theoretically if the conditions are right and i guess something else happened life could have formed on europa deep deep underneath the ice uh, feeding off of material from volcanic vents uh, and it would not know we existed and vice versa which is why i think less than a year from now uh the European Space Agency, the ESA, is launching a mission called JUICE, Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer, to send a big probe with a drill on it on Europa to start digging through the ice and hopefully find liquid water and then probably some really freaky looking crabs. We can also see evidence that Europa is filled with molten ice in the fact that even zooming in, there's, there's like two craters on the entire moon, which for something of its size is extremely unusual. Uh, the moon is famously covered almost entirely with craters aside from the lunar seas, but even then, most smaller bodies in the solar system are covered in craters. Even Mars on the older areas of Mars is heavily cratered, all resulting from this event possibly three and a half billion years ago, called the late heavy bombardment. The exceptions to this uh, that we know of, Venus and Earth, don't have that much craters because they have some form of tectonics. The surface changes over time, and thus craters get erased. Uh, Io is similarly the same, but volcanic craters outnumber meteor craters at that point. Europa, as well as Enceladus and Titan, which I can get into later, are very smooth. Something has been smoothing them out from the inside, whether that be ice volcanoes or cryovolcanoes that erupt slush or uh, processes similar to sea ice on Earth, where water pulls on the ice from below and smooths it out from the inside. Uh, so there, there's definitely a lot going on here. Probably similar for Ganymede, the largest moon in the solar system, uh, in Titan. Saturn's largest moon are even bigger than the planet Mercury, uh, meaning if they orbited the sun, they would likely be their own planets. As we can tell from Ganymede's signature patterns, some form of ice tectonics are happening here as well, but presumably not as much as uh, Europa, considering the fact that it still has plenty of craters pockmarking the surface, uh, and also the fact that it is over twice the size of Europa, much bigger than Earth's moon. Uh, it's also the only moon with its own magnetic field, meaning that this place has both an ice crust, liquid water, a rock crust, liquid rock, and then liquid metal in the very center, uh, resulting in a very interesting looking inside. But unfortunately, Callisto, the outermost of the Galilean moons, uh, because it is not part of that magical whole number ratio does not get the fun tidal heating and thus it's mostly dead on the inside. Hello there. 
uh, resulting in a moon that looks much more similar to Earth's moon than the other three Galilean moons, or even Titan. Uh, as you can see, we have another a lovely batch of guests here with Emmy uh, showing off the control room. It's just like Five Nights at Freddy's. You're on TV. Do you, do you want to say anything to the tour guests here on the internet? A uh, small boy here says hi. Hi, small boy. Uh, <laughs> but probably the most interesting body in the solar system, aside from the Earth, is Saturn's largest moon, Titan, which even through a telescope, uh, even through our telescope, if we catch it at the right time, around Saturn and its very famous system of rings, there's going to be an orange dot somewhere near it. It's unlike anything else in the solar system, aside from Earth and Venus and Mars too, I guess, in the fact that Titan has an atmosphere, which is extremely unusual for a moon. In fact, Titan's atmosphere is even denser than Earth. It's about uh, one and a half times or so, uh, to the point where, combined with the moon's lower lower gravity, uh, with big enough flippers, you could literally swim through the air on Titan. Uh, the air that, as you can tell from the blue haze, is similarly nitrogen-based, just like on Earth, but minus the oxygen. And also the fact that it is uh, minus 190 degrees Fahrenheit here, so you wouldn't be able to swim for very long before freezing to death, unfortunately. Uh, but through uh, radar images and the, the Huygens lander, we were finally able to peer through the orange uh, hydrocarbon-based clouds of Titan and found these uh, dark dune regions around the equator. But closer up north, lakes, Titan, as well as having an atmosphere, is the only body in the entire solar system to have known pools of liquid on its surface. But it's, again, minus 190 degrees Fahrenheit here. It can't be water. The, the rocks are water. Ice here is frozen as hard as granite, as found by the Huygens later. Uh, it landed in a riverbed with ice pebbles instead of rock pebbles. But the river wasn't a water. It was a methane, methane rain, uh, methane orange clouds, go back to here, and then methane lakes and rivers and even a methane sea close to the South Pole here. Uh, presumably, theoretically, there could be methane-based life on Titan inside of the methane sea because it's liquid, right? A liquid, liquid on Earth means there's life. Liquid on Europa and, and Enceladus, which is also another ice ball with, with even geysers on it, that probably means life. Surely there's got to be life in the methane. Uh, but also consider the fact that since it's so cold, chemistry, as we know it, slows down considerably. So even if we did even if there was something that could be considered alive, it wouldn't resemble any sort of animals or even plants or fungus like we keep have on Earth. It would have to be some sort of super slow metabolizing prokaryote thingamabob. Very alien. Uh, but even on Titan, it's technically another ice ball as the crust on Titan and all the rocks are made of ice, frozen rock hard. And in more recent probings, of Cassini, it found evidence of a couple possible cryovolcanoes on Titan, ice volcanoes that have erupted water, sludge, slush out of them. But it doesn't appear that the water on Titan is safe to drink because it is mixed with considerable amounts of ammonia. It, it'd be useful for, for cleaning your spaceship floor, but probably not much else, um, unless you like ammonia. Uh, and so this, as I mentioned earlier, is another ice ball, even if it's much, whoa, it's the wrong window. Even if it is much, much smaller than both Europa and even our moon, it's still uh, ice water all the way through. 
Cassini has found, there's even small bits of water on the surface, or at least water that was on the surface, because these tiger stripes, as they've been affectionately dubbed, are geysers caused by extreme tidal heating on the moon. Uh, the heat and pressure builds up to the point where water, steam, gets ejected out of these geysers into orbit around Saturn that eventually forms the, or at least partially forms the E-ring out here. No, no relation to Enceladus, at least name-wise. Definitely in composition-wise, as this one is mostly water ice and dust as compared to this, which is the more famous A and B rings, which are mostly rocky materials, I believe. I think this one is Earth. This is one of the famous pale blue dot images from Cassini. Really puts things into perspective that we're about that big across in the image. Uh, but Enceladus is probably, after Europa, another big contender for possible life holding because the water here thankfully does not have ammonia in it. According to samplings from the Cassini mission, uh, the water on Enceladus contains amino acids, the building blocks of life as we know it here on Earth, which it's, it's a good sign that something is happening inside there, but until somebody makes Seuss, Saturn icy mean, I guess say Saturn icy moon explorer uh, and start sticking around here, we're not gonna know for sure what's going on in here. We can only guess, like educated guesses. Uh, the, the both against are definitely more uh, popular targets here for observatory tours. And I know I've been talking a while, but does anybody have any questions so far before I show a couple more pictures? It doesn't have to be about what we just talked about. We can, I can answer anything. What shape is the earth? Well, All righty. I'm kidding. Which way? <laughs> no, Rob, it's obviously a dinosaur. It's a Velociraptor Earth gang. Yeah, there you go. Velociraptor Earth gang. Uh, this decisions, decisions. I'm already on here. Boom. This is, in fact, not a star. It is approximately millions of stars, an entire galaxy. The Whirlpool Galaxy, in fact, taken with our telescope, uh, as you can tell through the general grain and the, the ring-shaped distortions caused by dust on the mirror. We don't like it when it gets dirty. Uh, we have some more lovely students here with us. This is what the end result of a colorized image ends up looking like after we put in red, green, and blue filters. Again, we can tell uh, because of the light pollution here, everything, whoa, everything here looks just a bit redder because the red survives Raleigh effect more than blue and green. Uh, the Whirlpool Galaxy gets its name as such from its uh, grand design spiral shape as opposed to the more barred spiral, uh, the, the rectangular center like the, the Milky Way is. Uh, hey, yeah. There's Move a lot of the other screen for the folks in the home can see it. Oh, the other screen? Yeah, because we're right now we're looking at the Enceladus. I see. What are we looking at, Rob? Oh, I, I am looking at Enceladus, and you're talking about the world galaxy. Yeah. Oh no! Is is it on the wrong screen? Problem. I have no idea what is happening. Well, now I can see. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay. Yay, I love cables. I love cable issues. Here's the Whirlpool Galaxy. Now you can tell the signature spiral shape of M51. The M stands for uh, Messier because it is part of the Messier catalog, a series of 110 objects, uh, including stars, galaxies, and nebulas that uh, Charles Messier, the French astronomer, cataloged in the early 1800s. Uh, 
Obviously, this is the 51st object he found, along with this blob here, M52, a satellite galaxy of M51 that is being pulled in and pulled apart by the much larger spiral. You can tell here from the little band of dust, uh, after a few dozen million years, uh, M52 will get pulled in and then the regions of stars and dust will collide and coalesce, forming a lot more stars, but ejecting some in the process. Uh, very fun and chaotic and very pretty to look at from afar. The same thing will eventually happen to the Milky Way and its twice as large neighbor, Andromeda, which is M31, I believe, but we do not have the image of that. Unfortunately, we have the image of Andromeda satellite, uh, M33, the Triangulum Galaxy, which is another spiral galaxy, but smaller than both the Milky Way and Andromeda. Uh, all three galaxies in about 4 billion years will be pulled together uh, and then co coalesce, forming a colossal elliptical galaxy with the mass of all three. Uh, very creatively named Milkometer. I guess Triangulum is too small to count for the hybrid name. Uh, once the gas and dust eventually settles and hopefully the solar system does not get ejected, uh, millions upon millions of new stars will be born from the gas and dust all slamming into each other. And the supermassive black holes at both uh, the Milky Way and Andromeda then presumably triangulum as well, will all coalesce and do some funny gravity things as they spiral upon each other, uh, which would spell very bad news for anything from in the center of the galaxy. But thankfully, uh, we are about, uh, excuse me, 20,000, yeah, 20,000 light years from the center, about halfway across the galaxy, which is a pretty safe distance away. Uh, and also in 4 billion years, we'll have a lot bigger problems than the galaxies colliding, because by then the sun would become a red giant, uh, swallowing Mercury, Venus, and depending on whose math you're following, folks the Earth are, as well. On, one second. Uh, folks who are uh, on, the, uh, on the call, uh, I am going to be shutting down the stream because I need to shut down the room that I'm currently in. So I hope you all enjoyed this, and I uh, hope you all... Uh, if you're in the area, please come by and actually see us during our public hours on yes. Thursday, Friday, and Saturdays. So uh, with that, I will shut down the screen. Thank you and good night. Thank you all for coming.